Go on. The, the Life on Earth um, series, remember it's a 13 part series, yeah. um, landmark series yeah. that the BBC. Um, Which Attenborough commissioned in a sense. Enabled David Attenborough to do. Yes, he, yeah. he stepped down from being um, head of BBC Two because he wanted to make the series and he didn't want to be commissioning someone else to do it. He wanted to do it, <laughs> understandably. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so it was, I mean, it came a few days after the death of Digit. So we were grieving at the loss of a friend yeah. um, and dealing with the repercussions of that. Diane was ill um, and I was the camp gopher, so I was told to go for the BBC and went to find them in Kigali and bring them up to camp. Yeah. So the first day when we went out, it was quite late in the day and, and we decided not to film. We um, got close to the gorillas. We found Fear Trail. They had moved back into the saddle near to where Digit had been killed. Maybe they were looking for Digit. Mm. Digit's body was no longer there because scientists always take the body back to learn what they can from it. And, and we had a, a French doctor from Rungary, the nearby town, come up and do a dissection and, and learn what we could from Digit's body. And then he was buried outside Diane's cabin, the first such girl to be buried there. Prior to that, when we found um, skeletal material in the forest, it was labelled and sent off to the Smithsonian Institution in the States. But um, Digit's body had been badly mutilated, um, head was cut off and the hands were cut off, so it was an incomplete specimen if you want to think of it in that sense. But of course the emotional reasons for Diane wanting Digit to be buried there uh, were what predominated. And I shot the film of Diane seeing Digit's body brought back to mm -hmm. camp. And then um, he was buried, and before he was buried, we tried to do a, a reconstruction of, of the death scene because um, during the fight, Digit had killed one of the poacher's dogs. Um, we had lots of confiscated spears, so we tried to do a dramatic reconstruction, uh, which has never been used, but the, the footage exists in National Geographic um, archives. And uh, it was a, a few days later that the BBC came and Diane had met David Attenborough before um, in London once and was greatly looking forward to introducing them to the gorillas but she was coughing blood and not very well. Ah. So I, I took them out to group four initially. Group four had, had been back in the saddle near to where Digit had been killed and, and we think had run into poachers again because we came across fear dump. Hmm. And when gorillas are frightened they flee, often in single file and there's dollops of diarrhoea because they're that afraid. Yes. And so when we got close to them, um, it was quite late in the day and we, we said, well, let's not film, I'll just introduce you to them. And uh, Martin Saunders, the cameraman, had said, well, I've got a 600mm lens, I'm confident I'll get some good shots. And I said, well, if you're going to be filming eyeballs, you need a wide-angle lens. But again, no one had really conceived of the idea that we might be sitting in a family yeah. of gorillas. So we approached the group and they're feeding in, in the late afternoon and, and I'd explained that, that when they get close we, we kneel down so that we're not towering over them and that would reassure them and then I would vocalise to tell them that we were coming so I'd be saying <clears throat> as we approach and that if you're in the way just step out of the way if a gorilla comes along and we're looking at a gorilla feeding up a tree in there and a, a black back tiger I should think, a black back called tiger came up behind and just kind of elbowed his way past the film crew, excuse me, excuse me, and, and oh wow, it's, it's, it's unlike any wildlife filming um, situation that you, you can think of, yeah. it's not sitting in a hide for weeks on end hoping to get a glimpse of something, it's being invited on a family picnic, and all the members of the family are eating and playing and relaxing and snoozing in the sun with their hands behind their head, and you just pick your shots yeah. all around. So the next day was when we went out and started filming proper, properly and uh, that was when David, I don't know to what extent he'd, he'd scripted it the night before, but um, he, he said those very profound words about you know, there's more meaning and mutual understanding in exchanging a glance with a gorilla than any other animal I know. And he goes on and on and on and, and, and ends up with the obvious um, observation to anyone who is with gorillas, see how gentle they are, that we portray them as being this monster and that's the one thing that, that we are, at least can be, yeah. we can behave monstrously and that they aren't unless someone's 
threatening their life. So yes, it was a, I think a landmark event and the fact that the series was so widely viewed and that, that sequence was seen almost as a pinnacle of the whole series in the primates program, Life in the Trees, and, and that sort of contact with the gorillas that the producers and, and, and John Sparks, um, who was trying to d direct the scene, and that they, they shot a bit of the material when Pablo sat on him and rolled around on yeah. him, more as a, as a laugh, yeah. because they couldn't see how they would use it in a serious documentary that was, he was supposed to be talking about the opposing oh, with the person thumb, thumb right. and yeah. uh, ability to manipulate. And, and the manipulation was actually Pablo trying to undo his shoelaces. <laughs> I, I, I disappointed he didn't say, see how suitably adapted uh, the primate hand is for fiddly tasks like if he didn't, he laid his back and laughed. <laughs> oh boy. So that, that must have been extraordinary. And at the end of the day shooting, um, were you all together? Were, you, were, were, were the crew st staying? Yes, they, they stayed yeah. up at Karasoki for a few days. Yeah. And, uh, um, but this was in the days of film. Yeah. So there was no reviewing of rushes no. there and then. Now with digital, we can sit and look, see what we've got and, yeah. and uh, adapt the next day to, to try and get things that you didn't get the first day. Yeah. Then it was all in a can and it had to be sent off to be developed. And you hoped yes. that the exposure, the focus, the humidity and everything hadn't in some way ruined the footage. Yeah. And uh, then there was the, the political ramifications in that the, um, the local authorities had got the idea, erroneously, that the BBC were filming Digit's body and putting out what would be negative material about Rwanda being unable to protect its gorillas. Yeah. So there was a roadblock set up to stop the BBC and they were going to confiscate the footage. And in the back, um, Martin Solis swapped the labels of rolls of film ready so that if they confiscated it, he would give them unexposed film oh, yeah. and, and kept the, the footage that they'd got in cans that, that seemed like they hadn't been exposed. Um, but in the end, they sorted out that, that misunderstanding and went on their way. They went on to film at Gombe. Ah, where Jane Goodall, where Jane Goodall right. is. So, yeah. uh, and I said to David Attenborough, having grown up reading his ZooQuest books yeah. and seeing them on television since I was a child, I said on the way back from the gorillas on that first day, walking through a glade in the sunshine at 10,000 feet in Rwanda, there can't be many natural history greats that you haven't seen yet, although he's gone on to make more and more programmes where he's seen more and more. Mm. But he said, no, I've been very fortunate. Last week I was swimming with manta rays off the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Next week I'll be in Gombe with Jane Goodall. <laughs> <laughs> that man has had such an amazing life. <laughs> extraordinary, extraordinary.